announcements that we posted a new web page yesterday um, with information on the impact of viral mutations on COVID-19 tests. So this is a follow-up to the um, letter to healthcare providers and clinical laboratory staff that we issued in January um, regarding the potential for false negative results due to the impact of viral mutations on molecular SARS-CoV-2 tests. Um, the webpage includes information about um, viral mutations and the potential impact, as well as listing specific molecular tests that are impacted or where we have seen the potential for impact um, by viral mutations and specific recommendations for those tests. Um, right now, the webpage includes the, um, the three tests that were included in the January safety alert, um, as well as new information on three CEPHIAD tests um, based on new information that we have received. Going forward, we intend to um, include updates related to viral mutations and the potential impact on tests on this webpage, and we'll, we will um, announce any updates through um, through this venue, as well as um, email um, email blasts out to the the email list um, and um, inclusion on the regular COVID update press releases. Um, so we'll use that as a uh, central location for those types of updates, rather than individual safety alerts um, each time there are um, issues that that we become aware of. Um, so that web that um, website um, is uh, you can find that on our web page, um, and there should have been an email that went out yesterday as well that uh, I believe most people on this call likely received. Thanks, um, Toby. Maybe, um, yeah, go ahead. And um, you know, this is an effort to uh, keep everybody updated on the current status of mutations and testing, um, and, and it's there, you know, for easy access. Uh, and so thanks, Toby, and the team for um, making that uh, that happen. And as before, uh, currently uh, um, we do not know of any uh, significant impact of mutations on overall test performance, um, and that includes the new addition with with Cepheid, which is a multi-target assay, um, and uh, only only one uh, target was affected uh, by by two different mutations as. Is updated in our uh, in the mutation update. So um, that test and, and the others uh, still remain, um, you know, strong uh, options for uh, fighting this pandemic. And uh, it's out of an abundance of caution that we make these updates. And we know that users might spot uh, potential problems uh, ahead of uh, a developer and or the FDA, and we uh, ask your assistance and uh, identifying um, concerns and bringing them to us. Uh, thank you. Back over to you, Toby. Great, thanks, Tim. Um, so we also had a couple of questions last week that we wanted to follow up on. Um, one is regarding um, whether vaccinated people can be included or must be excluded from uh, validation studies for molecular diagnostic and antigen um, diagnostic. SARS-CoV-2 tests. Um, and generally, we do think that it's okay to include um, vaccinated individuals for um, validating an asymptomatic population, uh, but those um, should be analyzed separately from um, unvaccinated individuals. And I, I would add, are we, uh, can if I could add something? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I would add that, you know, there are now reports of breakthrough uh, infections with, uh, with some of the vaccines um, and, and the reports I've seen is no more than you know, mild symptoms, um, if any. Um, but of course, we don't know if the viral levels in, in those patients uh, who have been vaccinated are going to be any different than um, unvaccinated individuals who infected for the first time. So. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Thanks, Toby. Thanks for that addition, Tim. Um, another question that we had from last week is regarding the um, the template for at-home testing. And there was a question about the age inclusion in that template. In one place, um, it lists the lower um, end of the age range as three, and in another place um, in the template, it lists it as two. 
that is a typo. Um, two is the age that should be included in both of those places in that template. Um, we, we do recommend starting at two years old for nasal swabs. Um, for saliva, we recommend um, slightly older for, um, to include school age, five or six, um, because we have seen some usability issues with younger kids. Um, but we, we do welcome um, you to demonstrate um, usability in, uh, in younger kids with a usability study if, um, if your design um, is conducive to that. Um, we also um, have heard that some sites have had a difficult time enrolling kids for the clinical study and often are not getting any positives in that population. So we are asking that either the usability study or the clinical study or both if possible um, include uh, children or um, if you're in intending to include children in your indication. So moving on to some of the questions that we received by email, um, we have one regarding um, uh, seeking an EUA for an expanded respiratory panel. Um, and whether um, EUA requests for expanded respiratory panels will be prioritized or not. Um, because this, uh, there, there have been some, um, or I guess this question is asking about a particular one that was deprioritized. Um, so we just want to clarify that there are many factors that go into our prioritization decisions, um, and some of those factors may not be publicly evident um, regarding the tests that are authorized. We have previously um, stated that we prioritize review of EUA requests for tests that increase testing accessibility, such as point of care, home collection, and at-home tests, and tests that would significantly increase testing capacity, such as um, tests that reduce reliance on test supplies, high throughput, widely distributed tests uh, to address the public health needs. And um, we do recommend that if you have questions about a decision about your particular test, that you reach out um, to ask that specific yeah, and I would I would add that you know at this time in the pandemic uh, is very different. Our needs are very different as a nation than they were um, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and what was possible at the beginning of the panic pandemic. So um, we seek to uh, focus uh, review attention and prior and prioritization, and, and and basically call out to developers what uh, what the uh, for you know to give incentive to develop tests that um, that are really needed um, right now. And so uh, high volume accurate results, uh, whether they're in the laboratory or they're at home um, or home collection um, are uh, or in point of care are the are the priorities right now. Um, and uh, and just wanted to clarify that. Thanks, Toby. Great. Thanks, Tim. So our next question is about using an EUA comparator method for, um, for a clinical study for a 510K submission. Um, and asking, uh, we did talk about this last week that, um, that even though the BioFire um, assay has been granted an e, uh, de novo, um, that we still do um, intend to uh, consider EUA um, SARS-CoV-2 assays to be an appropriate comparator um, for future 510K submissions. However, this question is specifically asking about using an EUA assay as a comparator for um, the flu component or flu, RSV, other respiratory um, analytes in a multiple, in a multi-analyte respiratory panel. And we do want to clarify that um, for uh, evaluating the clinical performance of your multi-analyte test, we recommend that detection of the non-SARS-CoV-2 analytes, such as flu and RSV, um, should be compared to a, a, a 510K cleared molecular test. The EUA authorized tests may be used as a comparator for SARS-CoV-2. And we received another question about at-home COVID tests and um, asking why there are not more. Um, we do have four at-home COVID tests 
projects that are currently authorized. Um, and we do continue to encourage the development and submission of at-home tests. We've previously discussed that we, um, we do continue to support innovation in testing and providing support and flexibility to test developers with the goal of increasing the availability of um, accurate and reliable tests. But we do uh, need to point out that FDA does not develop tests. Um, we cannot compel test developers to develop tests with specific character, char excuse me, characteristics, um, although we have uh, indicated our priorities, which do include tests for home use. We're also not involved in the production or distribution of tests. Um, so we do um, encourage the availability of tests that we have authorized, but we are not involved in that. Um, our role is to determine whether the tests submitted by test developers for emergency use authorization meet the criteria for authorization um, so that we can provide a le level of assurance that they produce results that Americans can trust. And we continue, we will continue to work with test developers to support the availability of more innovative testing options. Uh, yes, and you know, uh, unfortunately to date um, with regards to molecular and antigen tests specifically, uh, we have simply had a paucity of fully uh, validated for home use tests submitted. So we do um, encourage uh, test developers to come in with uh, home use tests uh, and we've made it much easier now um, to get that OTC um, claim um, uh, beginning without um, any uh, data on asymptomatics uh, prior to authorization. And that pathway was outlined last week where um, if your performance meets a certain level um, in, uh, in home user studies uh, for symptomatic patients, um, then um, you can uh, simply agree to uh, update your label with, with a serial testing claim uh, and we will update your authorization um, for OTC and, uh, and uh, look forward to receiving a post-market uh, study showing performance, uh, uh, adequate performance uh, in, in the asymptomatic population via that uh, serial testing program. Thanks, Toby. Thanks, Jim. That's a good point that that new pathway will hopefully um, speed things up for at-home tests. Um, last week, we also talked a little bit about the use of serology tests after vaccination, um, and we received a specific question about, um, about which serology tests um, would show antibodies after you've gotten the vaccination. Um, so we do want to clarify that the currently authorized um, SARS-CoV-2 antibody tests are not validated or authorized um, to evaluate protective immunity, um, and they're not specifically labeled for use after, um, after vaccination. The clinical significance of a positive or negative SARS-CoV-2 antibody test result in individuals that have received a COVID-19 vaccination is currently unknown. Not all detectable antibodies are protective and for other illnesses, and SARS-CoV-2 antibody tests do not directly evaluate other components of the adaptive immune, system, immune response, such as cellular immunity, which may contribute to protection from infection after vaccination. Additionally, um, since vaccines induce antibodies to specific viral protein targets, post-vaccination serologic test results will be negative in persons without history of previous natural infection if the test that was used does not detect antibodies induced by the vaccine. Thanks, Toby. And I would add that uh, all three authorized vaccines in the U.S. have uh, only spike protein uh, components in them. So um, obviously a serology test that doesn't target um, a spike protein will, will not be a, a good measure um, of uh, whether there is an immune response to the vaccine. And we have received reports of uh, false negatives um, when clinicians have ordered, say, an N protein um, a serology test uh, following vaccination with one of the three authorized vaccines. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for adding that. And uh, we received a question about whether. Um, there are any 3D printed materials used in COVID-19 tests. Um, and we do have, uh, we are aware of some manufacturers 
that have produced 3D printed swabs, and we have additional information about that um, on our COVID-19 test FAQ page. There is a section on uh, 3D printed swabs specifically. Now, I would add that um, a 3D printed, uh, printing can be applied to uh, other uh, components other than swabs. Uh, and there's no prohibition um, against the, the use of 3D um, uh, printing to say, produce cassettes or uh, other components. Um, um, we would uh, just simply ask to, to put that information into, um, if, if it's a new test being developed, put that into the pre-EUA to ask us any questions that might be relevant to that method of manufacturing. Thank you. Echo, you too. That's a great point. Uh, the next question that we have is about the restructuring of the diagnostic EUA webpage. Um, I think we mentioned this last week that we um, broke it out so that there will be separate pages now for molecular um, antigen and serology. Uh, this was a function of the page getting too big with so many tests having been authorized. Um, so separating them um, should improve usability and uh, functionality of the page. The question that we received is about um, why we removed certain information, specifically the, um, the date the EUA was first issued. And so I want to clarify that we did not remove that. The, there was no information um, that changed with the, with the split. It was just um, split into separate pages. But the information that was on the original page is now on the separate pages for molecular antigen and serology. Um, as um, it was before on the, the individual or on the uh, single page, there was um, there is a, a column. The first column is the date of the latest update, and the date that the EUA was first issued is included in the column with the link uh, to the letter of the authorization. So that remains um, the same as it was. Um, we have a question about an antigen self-collect over-the-counter um, rapid diagnostic test with a companion app um, where the companion app supports patients in understanding how to properly administer the test and also supports public health reporting. Um, and the question is about um, what to do if, the, if an over-the-counter customer does not own a compatible device and whether um, an ancillary mechanism must be provided for public health reporting. So um, if a test may be performed with either a companion app or an alternate form of instructions, we would expect to see validation with validation data um, with both options. We generally recommend that you develop a test procedure that is easy to follow in the form of a quick reference instruction. Um, and user instructions should be oriented to users at no higher than a seventh grade reading level. Um, it's highly recommended that you consider adding pictures and diagrams to facilitate performance of the test by a lay user and that the instructions be limited to one to two pages. Um, we do uh, agree that web or mobile application based materials such as videos may be particularly helpful. And regarding reporting to um, public health um, authorities, we are, we uh, mentioned this on this call previously, we are not requiring a reporting mechanism at the time of authorization for at-home tests, but we do encourage all test developers to consider an approach to facilitating, to facilitate the reporting of test results to public health authorities. Um, and since this is not a requirement at the time of authorization, we can discuss further options um, during the review of an EUA request. Our next question is um, regarding um, the development of rapid tests for um, antigen and antibody. Um, specifically, a few questions about at-home um, serology tests and whether there is a template available. Um, we have not yet published a template for at-home serology tests, and we're not able to speak to when um, or whether there will be one that is published. Um, however, we know that some uh, test developers have received some draft feedback from the review team, and that is still a good starting point. 
if you have specific questions about your own um, validation or study design, you can reach out through the mailbox or to your review team if you already have one. Um, there is a, additionally a question about um, a test, a serology test that has already received an EUA for point of care and what additional uh, performance data is needed. Um, so we would expect to see uh, validation in an at-home setting if you are looking to, um, to have an at-home claim. There are, um, we've received multiple questions about uh, the, tr the transition from EUA um, to 510K um, and regarding study design. So we do encourage um, test developers that are interested in um, feedback on studies for a 510K to consider submitting a pre-sub um, so that we can make sure that we're giving um, complete and, and appropriate feedback for your specific submission. Well, that would include the number of samples of each type that we're recommending for full validation. Thanks, Debbie. Yeah, great. Um, for asymptomatic claims in a point of care antigen um, test, we've received uh, questions about the right proportion of symptomatic versus asymptomatic um, for inclusion in a clinical study. The antigen template for test developers does include our recommendations um, that performance be um, confirmed by testing a minimum of 30 positive and 30 negative specimens in a randomized blinded fashion. And that if you're seeking authorization for screening individuals without symptoms or other reasons to suspect COVID-19, that you include the intended population um, in, your, in your clinical study. Um, so in addition to the, the 30 and 30, we would uh, recommend that you enroll at least 20 positive asymptomatic individuals. And you may also um, want to consider the approach that we outlined in the recently issued supplemental template for serial screening that Tim also mentioned um, a little earlier on this call, where you can request a serial screening claim based on only symptomatic validation data with a post-authorization condition to validate serial screening. And, and if you're going the original pathway of um, an, a testing asymptomatic uh, patients uh, pre-authorization, we will accept as few as 10 asymptomatic patients in the application to make a decision uh, with the commitment um, uh, after authorization of, of completing the 20, if 20 are required, of, uh, in that uh, post op, uh, in the in the conditions of authority. Uh, of authorization rather. Thanks. Great. Um, and just to go a little bit further on the um, the post market topic, um, we we have had some questions about um, if if the clinical study was based on symptomatic subjects, um, can the uh, test developer add asymptomatic post market and um, and how many? And so that is. Um, what we were just referring to both for the, um, the serial screening claim as well as if you have um, only 10 um, positive asymptomatics that we would consider um, authorization without that additional asymptomatic data um, with the post-authorization uh, commitment. And we will discuss the, um, the post-authorization study uh, during your review. So you can submit your proposed post-authorization validation study um, in your supplemental EUA request to expand that indication. Um, we received a question about a serology tests um, seeking point of care authorization and um, whether we can include uh, whether whether a manufacturer could include a subset of individuals who have received um, at least one of one dose of a COVID vaccine, as long as they uh, were previously identified as um, infected and then were subsequently vaccinated. Um, generally, we recommend um, referring to the, our template for serology tests um, for our recommendations for clinical validation. 
Um, and at this time, we don't have any recommendations on study designs to support the use of um, serology assays as an aid to assessing immune response of individuals that have previously been immunized um, with a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And our last um, uh, present question is regarding the manufacturing of a serology test um, in the U.S. versus uh, manufacturing in China. Um, and it is asking for a list of government approved components. Uh, so we can clarify that we do not have um, a list of government approved components for use in manufacturing. Um, we do review EUA requests for the final finished um, devices and the EUA applicant would be responsible for all data manufacturing and other FDA requirements applicable to the finished device, including any quality system requirements that are not waived um, per the letter of authorization. Um, and with that, um, Tim, if you have any other updates uh, or we can uh, go on to the live questions. Oh, let's go into uh, Q&A. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one, unmute your phone, and record your name clearly. Your name is required to introduce your question. If you need to withdraw your question, press star two. Again, to ask a question, please press star one. Our first question comes from Wendy Chow. Hello. Wendy. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. I have a question uh, on the asymptomatic and symptomatic, uh, those requirements for the study of the either antigen uh, or molecular test. Uh, have this question for a while because I think at the end it's the sensitivity or LOD that matters uh, regardless if it's symptomatic or asymptomatic because we know for some asymptomatic people their viral load is super high as well and of course more symptomatic people have higher um, viral load. Uh, I think as much as the study covers the whole spectrum of the uh, viral load, it should be okay, right? It's not like asymptomatic people have different virus or respond differently to the testing. So that's a question actually in my mind for a while. Why should we um, actively differentiate those two populations instead of just use the LOD or sensitivity or like in terms of molecular test, it just use the CT distribution of the CT. And um, so this is a, and then a related question is about LDT. So for LDT, we actually put a lot of emphasis on the sensitivity on the LOD. Uh, we really like analytical part, really don't care about the, if the people comes with a symptom or not. As long as we have the good sensitivity, we can detect anyone. So that's my question here. What's the philosophy or what's the, the 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 point behind um, which we I may missing is uh, about the, the differentiate the population. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, so you know, asymptomatic uh, carriers of <clears throat> of a, a you know a, a BSL three virus uh, is is unusual um, and um, you know and we're still learning about the biology of the disease um, the data that we've seen are mixed is whether uh, uh, for a given device in a given population um, whether viral loads and detection of asymptomatics are, are equivalent to symptomatics and and in other words, we have seen differences between those populations, and when we see 
difference is the viral loads are lower um, for asymptomatic carriers. Um, and uh, therefore, um, when you look at the whole test uh, and how it's performed, um, which is um, more, uh, which is important, and not just LOD, because LOD assessment can vary um, from developer to developer. Uh, there aren't necessarily good ways to harmonize, uh, and also to translate in that into clinical sensitivity. So um, we uh, have really, because these are EUA authorizations, we have the authority under the law lower um, the recommendations for validation um, and you know instead of a couple hundred um, uh, virus positive uh, patients in a, in a clinical study for full authorization um, we have required only for symptomatic populations uh, 30 positives uh, at the minimum um, and then um, to add an asymptomatic uh, claim uh, pre-market, again, only 10 positive symptomatic patients. So uh, with, uh, as appropriate, with an agreement to um, complete more asymptomatic uh, test uh, studies after, uh, after authorization. So the, 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 the bottom line is that uh, we look at the performance of the whole test, not just an in-laboratory LOD, because that tells you how the test will perform in, uh, most closely in the real world. Um, and we have seen uh, significant differences in, uh, in viral load uh, and detection, actual sensitivity or PPA uh, between symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals in the same study. All right. Right, because of the, yeah, the two population, uh, yeah, I agree, like in the symptomatic, there's a, a lot more people with a high viral load. And uh, instead of being asymptomatic, there are much less people with the higher viral load. They have more weak ones. So I think that the problem right now is we don't really have a, a international standard to determine the LOD, right? So the LOD is every place, everywhere. You really can rely on that number. So once we have a, a international standard to determine LOD, and then it comes to the uh, to the um, if the lab all followed or develop all use those standard, and then there's a common comparison, and then it's a, it, it will be less um, important to uh, right now we just kind of use the, the 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 live samples from people where this population that population their their viral distribution is different, so of course the result will be different. Uh, or sometimes the sampling could be different. Maybe in the symptomatic, so they will have more in some specific anatomic sites versus uh, uh, asymptomatic. But uh, what I'm thinking is that uh, the lack of those international standards uh, may push us to go to uh, kind of empirically to get all those uh, population. So that's just so, what I'm thinking yeah. here. And, I, I just trying to yes, figure out what's gonna, the efficient way. Yeah, we're gonna mm -hmm. we're, we're gonna we're gonna move on to the next caller. There are uh, mm -hmm. there is an uh, international standard available for molecular tests, mm -hmm. and um, and so that can be used um, um, at least for a truly quantitative tests, which most molecular tests aren't truly quantitative. They haven't been developed for that purpose. They haven't been calibrated for that purpose. Um, um, and then, of course, then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll all want to see data, you know, when you have an international standard uh, related quantitative molecular test and look at CTs and look at things like infectivity, um, however, to gather that, that data about what's truly, uh, what's truly a level of infectivity, even if you could harmonize the way samples are collected, um, because there is a variable in uh, there are many variables in determining the viral level with a respiratory sample, um, and it's not a it's not as easy as say HIV quant uh, is and straightforward because that sample type is whole blood, uh, and uh, or uh, a whole you know a venous puncture sample, and and it is uh, uh, more challenging with respiratory sample and and very clearly. Uh, APHL and CAP and the CDC have said that 
correlating CTs with infectivity or determining a level below or above which um, you can make clinical decisions is very challenging. Um, so we're going to move on to the next caller. Thank you. Our next question comes from Susan Sheldon. Hi, Tim and Tony. Thank you so very much for all your efforts in this uh, uh, town hall meeting. I appreciate them and learn a lot. I have two quick questions. One, if we have an, um, we we have two sample types, can we include them in the same emergency use authorization if we provide the data in one, or do we have to have separate one for each sample? It's an in-home test use. No, the, uh, for in-home use, uh, different sample types, we would want to see performance um, and usability um, for uh, and user comprehension for both types of sampling. Um, but right, I understand. But do you need them in two separate emergency use authorization requests, or can I put them in the same in one? They, they can go into the same uh, into the same. Okay. Solution. The next question is that if we instruct the patient to cough and spit in a cup. Would you be calling that specimen saliva slash sputum? What would what would be the appropriate name regulatory wise when we, we that's the instruction to the patient? What would we call the sample? Yeah, yeah. So that's the that's a, a bit of an unusual uh, sample collection method, and I would invite you to reach out um, through a pre EUA um, to our develop uh, to our review staff to address that specific question, since that's not going to be a, a hugely common sample type. So um, how would I do that? Um, you, you, um, so you take the, the template for whatever test you're developing, and you only have to ask the questions that you want in there, and you would be asking how to, um, how to uh, you know, whatever questions you have about that particular sample type, you can put into the EUA template. and. Um, and send it in. Um, since you're not you're not submitting an EUA, you're not submitting data. You're asking questions. We classify that as a um, uh, as a pre uh, EUA submission. Uh, and you can send it to the template's email address, and they will log it in as a as a pre EUA, so that we can track it uh, and get responses back to you. As a reminder, if you have a question, please press star one. And if you can, please only ask one question so we can get to everyone today. Thank you. Our next question comes from Marcella Vasgrove. Um, hello. Um, hi, I'm Marcella, human factor specialist uh, representing user white consulting. We have a client in South Korea that would like to conduct clinical testing for a COVID-19 antigen test kit in the Philippines. Are they required to seek IRB oversight in the U.S. for the study if they wish to submit this data for a EUA? Also, theoretically, if an international antigen test kit manufacturer desired to conduct a clinical study in a country with no IRB requirements, would they be able to submit this data to the U.S. FDA after having no IRB oversight or no? Um, so, you know, we encourage developers to follow um, uh, local, um, state, and, and, and federal uh, rules where the studies are um, uh, are done. Uh, it is not something that uh, that we're asking or reviewing um, for EUAs at this time. Um, is this a, uh, is this a point of care or a home use study? Um. Uh, COVID antigen test kit. Yeah, so we're encouraging a point of care uh, and home use uh, antigen uh, and other rapid and molecular rapid tests that the studies be performed in the U.S. if possible, um, and so that um, we are simulating uh, and, and mimicking all, how the tests are going to be used uh, in the U.S. We've seen challenges with. Um, international studies for home and or a point of care um, where the site, for example, really aren't point of care. Um, and and so this, uh, since the U.S. market is very large for these type of devices, um, we want to know how it's going to perform. Um, we These are recommendations. Um, if somebody wants to do this uh, in a different way, 
um, then we would encourage them to first check with the FDA on their study design to make sure that um, that it would be acceptable for review and authorization if the data look good. Okay, so the, the South Korean client would be required for IRBX oversight? Um, I, I, again, we would, um, you know, encourage all developers to follow wherever the studies are done, you know, local, state, and federal requirements for those for those localities. We are not reviewing IRB uh, IRB documents for EUA reviews. Um, okay. You know, if these studies are are done in the U.S., typically there's IRB and or consent um, that the local, state, and, and uh, federal uh, uh, rules would require. Okay, um, we're going to have to move on to the next caller. Our next question comes from Deb Payne. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hello? Okay, hi, Tim. Uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing here. Um, we're a lab where we want to have a prescription uh, home-based collection that, where the sample is collected and sent back to us. And we have tried to reach out to various manufacturers or, or groups that have previously um, gotten their collection device through right to reference them, but none of those suppliers are really too keen in providing us uh, their particular collection device. And there is one uh, collection device where it was stated on the, I think it's a foam collection that was stated on the templates that the right to reference was granted. Do we need to specifically, I think it's, I can't remember the particular group. Um, do we need to reach out and get a right to reference from that group that is, stated in the templates already? So, um, it depends. So there are some, um, so we've now authorized over 50 uh, home collection uh, submissions. Um, and there are a growing number of manufacturers who, um, um, you know, are providing uh, opportunities for developers such as yourself to um, participate. Um, offline, it would be great to hear from you. You can send it to the template email address about um, just what the feedback you're getting from some of those are, because we would under like to understand the challenges faced by developers such as yourself in, that, in, in getting access to, access to these previously authorized home collection kits. Um, there is one um, situation where there is uh, that I know of, and Toby may know of others, where there's a global right of reference and, and the individual developers don't have to go and get that. And that's uh, based on a, and I'm forgetting both partners here, but it was a Gates uh, sponsored study um, where they did um, home collection uh, using, um, uh, uh, using a, a nasal swab um, and a particular media. I'm not sure if it was both VTM and saline, the details escape me. But if you were to mimic exactly what they did uh, in their study, which is totally acceptable, you know, that works. Uh, and it makes it easy for developers like you to then get that right reference because you don't have to go to Gates to get it. Um, and it's just a global. Um, so the best way to find out about all that is really to send a specific question into uh, the template's email address asking about um, a global right of reference for um, any home collection uh, devices. I don't, and Toby, you may know if, 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 those are also offered for other than um, this nasal swab uh, opportunity. I'll pause for Toby to add anything. Yeah, I think um, what you're what you may be referring to, um, Deb, is um, in our FAQs where we do reference this Quantigen Gates data um, and the right. um, the broad right of reference. That is to um, to specific uh, data uh, studies that were done. It's not for a specific home collection kit. So um, as Tim was getting at, if you were to develop your own home collection kit that used the same, um, the same procedures as what they validated, then you would be able to leverage the data that they've already um, collected 
and have offered the broad right of reference to. And you, okay. and you don't need to, to go to them to get that permission. That's that they've always, they've already granted that globally. And, um, and so okay. we have that doc, we have that documented. So, um, you know, to, to get the particulars then, you know, of this then, um, and about how you'd go about using that right of reference and what we, um, uh, what we would expect in a submission, we can come in with a pre-EUA. Um, and these home collection kits are a priority for our office. So, thank you. And, and this would be prescription based. And I didn't know whether um, the bar would be lower for prescription based. So uh, for prescription based, uh, I believe the, the, the Gates Clonogen uh, study was on, on symptomatic individuals. Uh, and for prescription based, you don't need asymptomatic individuals. Um, um, however, if the performance is, is good enough, you can, this, this serial pathway we've been talking about for OTC is possible. But for prescription, the, 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 the recommendations are less uh, because we know that a prescriber is involved and is taking uh, some responsibility for ensuring uh, oversight of the testing. And, and that allows us to. Um, and to be more focused in our review. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Ella Kiyokor. Thank you for uh, taking my call. I appreciate your effort in uh, answering our questions. Uh, my question pertains to use of genetic algorithms in interpretation of the raw data to extract the result. Uh, how can one gain acceptability of that kind of approach? And if that is something that is a matter of the future, then uh, my second question would be about using the same group of uh, users for validating a test for individual use at the point of contact and uh, by pooling. So these are my questions. Thank you. So yeah, so hang on to just clarify. So are you also developing a, a detection method for SARS-CoV-2 virus? Correct. Uh, it's a molecular your, uh, detection method, genetic molecular detection method with the original method of uh, generating signals, different from RT-PCR, but related, simpler, cleaner, one step direct, and results in 20 minutes. Okay. So That's we okay. have submitted a, pre a uh, request for information, and uh, that in the belief that uh, we need to refrain from using the uh, IT and machine learning from generating the results. I want to verify that this is a correct approach for our future generations. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure that I understand, but um, but I, you're adding on software. So you have a, a detection a method that can determine presence or absence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in a sample. Right. Um, and you're With adding an AI or machine learning and, uh, software on top of it? Uh, that uh, would be something hidden from the user entirely. Okay. It would be the internal portion of the black box, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, th that's a very specific question about your device and why, uh, uh, you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning would be helpful and needed for your test, but you know, developers can choose what to do what they want, um, and and we would uh, and we would certainly uh, accept it and, and review it. Um, but there would be, um, you know, there would be additional review questions uh, around the use of such software, uh, and that's um, and that's where a pre EUA with the specifics of what your development program looks like and the specific questions you have. Um, around the use of AI or ML um, in your in your submission, so I see. Um, there would there, uh, there's a software. Uh, I think most of the templates have a software section now, so this would be covered under the under the software. Um, and you know, and we have a white paper out on 
on artificial intelligence from the CDRH Center uh, that gives some uh, some high level guidance about our current thinking. And there are different kinds of uses of AI and ML, and that is uh, that's important for us to consider. Such as, do you, are you going to have a learning system, or are you going to use uh, ML to establish your cutoff, and then you're going to lock it down? So there's there's a whole, it's a large area, and we just need specifics so that we can answer your uh, questions that are that are important for you and your development process that are relevant only to your uh, test. Okay. Um, all right. Let's uh, move on to the next caller, please. Our next question comes from Tioa Wollup. Hello. Can't hear you. Hello. Hello, I can hear you now. Hello. Yes, hello. Um, yeah, I have a question on uh, submission of a pre-EUA uh, file. Uh, we're developing an uh, at-home test, uh, a novel kind of antigen test, um, and we could yet uh, submit our features and explanation of our product and the elements uh, into, um, or we could wait a little bit and have um, more experimental data, limit of detection, um, and a first usability study, the formative evaluation. What would FDA prefer to have uh, that um, you will submit already, or uh, we wait a bit to have more valuable data uh, to support our product proposition? Yeah, well, we're interested in getting um, a full uh, EUA submission for, especially for home antigen and home molecular tests. Uh, as soon as you can get it to us for review. Um, we have an at-home template um, that's online that, that hopefully provides all the information you uh, would require to, to or, or would need to um, to know how to, what our recommendations are for, for validation. Um, if you have any questions that aren't clear from the template, that's the reason to submit a pre-EUA. Um, otherwise, if if, mm -hmm. the, if the template is very clear to you on what to do, then you know I would encourage you to work on on the studies to uh, to go ahead and, and and demonstrate the performance of your test and submit that to us as soon as possible. And as I said, you know home home molecular and antigen tests um, that can be produced in in high volumes uh, uh, and made available to U.S. consumers at home uh, is is the, one of the highest priorities right now for us. That concludes our okay. question and answer session. I would now like to turn the call back over to Kimba Ford.